So my chickens are not liking the cold. Um, we installed a heater, I guess it was last week in our chicken coop. And now when I go and open up their door in the morning, they all just look at me like, what are you nuts? We're not leaving this nice warm coop. And so um, we had to set up the feeder inside and we had to shut off the external water because things are freezing. But the chickens are basically having nothing of it. They haven't left the, the chicken coop in like three days, three or four days now. So it feels like winter is upon us. Um, how are you guys all doing? How are you coping? I'm ready for winter to be over already. Are you ready for winter to be over already? Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I rode my bike on, on um, Saturday and, and it was my first day to get geared up in full winter gear. So um, yeah, not happy about winter. What about the rest of you? I actually love the cold. Do you? Where are you from, Marcus, originally? Absolutely. I'm from Kansas City, Kansas, so Midwest okay. area still. Okay. All right. A um, couple of things on Moodle. There are new prompts for food blogging. Uh, the first couple of prompts are about Halloween, since Halloween is less than a week away. Um, there's candy everywhere, it seems like. Um, so there are some candy related uh, prompts for the first week. Uh, the second week begins with a national election. And I recognize that uh, some of you may be feeling anxious about the election. So it has nothing to do with food, but if you feel anxious and you just want to vent a little bit of that anxiety out into the world without anybody making any comments on it, uh, feel free to do that on this blog. Um, so as a result, also, don't comment on anybody else's political rant. Uh, this is just a space where you can just kind of let loose without any judgment if you want to. Um, so that'll be the first post next week. And then the second post next week is about history. So since we're talking about history, I'm interested in kind of what your experiences are as far as your own history education. Uh, were you into history? Uh, when you've had history classes in the past, uh, what was it about those history classes that spoke to you, et cetera? Do comment on one another's comments, um, on, on one another's posts where the history is concerned. Um, and the other thing is when you make a comment on somebody's post, make it substantive. Don't just be like, I totally agree. Like that doesn't really, really doesn't add much to any sort of conversation. Um, there's also a assignment post up there for turning in your food journals for those of you who um, who are turning in your food journals um, online. There, it's on the November sixth day, which is the following week. So, so find that link there. Um, also, there is a survey. There's a link to a survey. It's just a general check-in survey. Um, take it. It's anonymous. Uh, respond honestly. It's basically just kind of get a feel for how you're feeling about the semester so far in CTI 259, uh, what we can do differently, what we can do better, et cetera, as far as um, your, your all performance in the class and, and what you're learning and how you're going about learning it. Um, so if you could take that, it shouldn't take you more than about five minutes to do that. And um, so that's that. Um, screen. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? All right, good, thank you, Olivia. Olivia always just gives me the thumbs up. All right. Um, so we were talking about the demographic transition and I think we finished up at the end of the demographic transition, is that correct? I'm trying to remember where we left off. Am I, am I correct? Yes, okay, thanks. All right, so, um, 
so we're trying to kind of get a handle on how our current food supply apparatus got set up, why it did it stop sharing. All right. After a semester of doing this relatively smoothly, lately I seem to be incapable of sharing screen adequately. All right. Okay, so now you can see the slides and they're moving, they're changing. Okay. So our, our goal is to try and figure out kind of how we got to the, the food supply um, apparatus that we currently have in the United States. So, um, as I mentioned before, back in the mid 1800s, the vast majority of people in the United States were involved in some way or another with agriculture. A relatively small proportion of the working populace was involved in uh, activities not related to agriculture. And so uh, what we've seen over the 170 years since then or whatever, however long it's been since the 1850s, uh, what we've seen is a shift in kind of how the United States employs its people, and that also has been reflected in, for example, where people are distributed in the United States. And so um, as we look at, this only goes back to 1900. So this is from this report, Dimitri et al. Uh, I posted this last Friday on the Moodle site. I'm not going to require that you read it, but if you have any questions about anything in it, uh, you can always go and reference that. You can also come and ask me about it, but the, the, the technical report is there. This is from a report uh, done by the um, Department of Agriculture, basically looking at trends in agriculture over, um, well, since the 1900s to 2005, which was when this was, was published. So what we see is that, um, over time, since 1900, um, the proportion of people involved in farming by 1900 was down to just below 40%, and it has dwindled down once again to, to where now it's basically under 2%. And at the same time that, that the proportion of Americans that are involved in agriculture has declined, so has the proportion of, of Americans that you would refer to as being uh, living in rural areas. And so, uh, we see this shift um, in the population away from rural cities, rural towns, and rural environments into urban environments, and that shift um, basically mirrors this shift away from agriculture as a major, uh, a major employer in terms of all the different segments of the, the economy. So if you look at the non-metro farming dependent communities in 1950 versus 2000, you can see that there's a large area in terms of county by county. And some of these counties are very large. So for example, Brewster County in, in Texas is actually larger than the state of Rhode Island. So counties are kind of an artificial way of thinking about this. But, um, but if we look at a county level, uh, we can basically see that there are lots of, of counties that were dominated by uh, uh, rural farming dependent communities as opposed to metropolitan communities. And you see that most of those have, have disappeared. And the only place that those primarily rural counties still exist is of course here in the agricultural Midwest. And so there's been that kind of shift on a county by county level that is just a, a more kind of fine scale look at the data that, that this piece of data uh, also shows. So all of these forms of data are consistent. We've become less rural and more urban over the last 120 years. Interestingly though, as the number of farms have declined, their size has increased. So once again, if we look at the number of farms, they peaked in the early 1900s and have been on a steady decline um, since the 1950s. And um, there are um, many fewer farms, but as those number of farms have declined, the number of acreage per farm has increased. And so uh, Poland talks about this um, in the book when he's talking to George Naylor in the first part of the book, 
when Naylor is bemoaning kind of the loss of the family farm. And so back in the 1800s and into the early 1900s, most farms were family farms, family owned farms. As a result, they were relatively small farms uh, farmed by the members of one family. We talked about the demographic transition and why during an agrarian system, during agrarian, uh, in agrarian societies, you have large family size and it's largely because you need a, a labor source to work the family farm. And so over time, as the number of farms has dwindled, uh, large corporations have bought up those family farms. And even though those family farms may still be farmed by the same people who were, were farming that land in the past, uh, it's no longer their land that they're farming. It's actually land that is owned by some larger entity and they farm that land as an employee of some corporation that owns the land that they, that they used to farm as a family farm. And so farm size has increased. It's not uncommon to talk to farmers here uh, in the Midwest who are, are farming 1,500, 2,000 acres of corn and soybeans. And that's a, that's a relatively large farm. Uh, I grew up in the country on a farm. Uh, we had four acres. Uh, we weren't a commercial farm. We were really just a farm that, that grew food for ourselves uh, for the most part. But um, I was also in an area that had quite a few ranches, but even ranches in, in that part of the country at the time were, were less than a thousand acres in many cases. So farm size has, has grown because these farms that used to be family farms have been consolidated into larger, larger holdings, mainly by, by corporations. So as they have grown in size and become consolidated, the total diversity of crops that these farms grow has declined. And so this is the proportion of the book in Vanishing Species uh, that, that I asked you to read for last week that Poland is talking about how uh, farms used to be relatively diverse in their crop mixture, and now they have been reduced in many cases to just one or two commodity crops. And uh, oftentimes these commodity crops are going to be um, corn and soybeans, especially in this part of the world. But for example, if you go down to Texas, um, my family on my mother's mother's side uh, were into rice farming. And so they're, one of the uncles owns a rice plantation. And that's pretty much all he grows there is, is rice. Um, so the, the diversity of the crop species that are being farmed has gone down uh, over, over the years. But productivity has gone up. So this is a complicated slide and it's taken from a couple of portions of the Dimitri report. Um, this first figure here is basically just showing um, farm, farm productivity indexed against the productivity in 1996. And so um, as time has gone on, we've gotten better in terms of use, utilizing technology for things like um, plowing, managing fields. Uh, most large farms, if you hop into a tractor, that tractor is being guided by GPS, uh, global positioning systems that allow the farmer to very precisely um, till and, and row that land so that he can get, he or she can get the most, uh, the most amount of productivity out of that acreage. So technology in how you prepare your fields, how you plant your fields, technology related to irrigation, technology related to pesticide use and herbicide use, all of these things have led to increases in productivity over time. And so uh, that's what this figure is showing. But I also want you to recognize how mechanization has changed. So this is a little box. In the report, there are a series of boxes uh, that kind of highlight things. And you, if you go back to 1900, there were 21.6 work animals. So this would be mules, horses, oxen, basically uh, work animals that are involved in helping, um, helping farmers do their jobs. In many cases, these organisms, these, these work animals were used for plowing. But in some cases, they were also used to, um, to power mills for, for grinding grain, um, threshing, things like this. But what you see over time is in 1900, there were basically no tractors in the United States because they hadn't really been invented yet. Um, by 1930, 
there were 920,000 tractors. And as a result of that, you see that the number of horses and mules and other worked animals has gone down to 18.7 million. By 1945, the number of tractors is at 2.4 million in the United States. And as a result, uh, the number of worked animals on farms has gone down to 11.6. By 1960, the number of tractors is at 4.7 million. And the number of horses and mules used for work power on farms has gone down to 3 million. So what this box illustrates is basically this slow transition from uh, getting the work on a farm done mainly by animals to a situation where most of the work that gets done on a farm is now done by, by um, machinery, uh, tractors, combines, things like this. I'm a little surprised that they don't have numbers um, beyond 1960 in this situation. But if you looked at it right now, you would even see more tractors and combines and things like this and, and even fewer uh, farm animals. So part of this productivity is actually due to this transition from animal power to, to fossil fuel powered farms in terms of the mechanization and, and how the work actually gets done on farms. When we look at exports of food, once again, these are all going to be indexed according to, to some year. So this is the percentage of exports relative to uh, 1987. And what you can see is that uh, in the early parts of the 20th century from, from 1915 to about 1940, you can see the exports were on a slow but steady decline. And then after 1940, we went through World War II, then after World War II, we begin to see exports starting to increase. And uh, for many years, we've been a major exporter of food to the rest of the world. We, as a nation, have uh, for a very long time produced way more food than we ourselves can consume. And so we've always been a player on, on the global food market. What's interesting and what I want you to pay attention to though is what was happening in the years leading up to World War II. World War II started in 1939 in Europe. But what you can see here is once again, a slow but steady decline in US exports. And this came about because basically Europeans stopped buying American food. And so in the early 1900s, there was this shift in Europe away from importing food from, from the United States. And this actually caused farmers a lot of problems in the pre-depression era. So before the Great Depression, you guys remember when the Great Depression kicked off? Go back to your history books. Was it like the mid thirties? It wasn't the mid thirties. We were already well into the, the depression by the mid thirties. Anybody know when when kind of the, the benchmark date is for the Great Depression? Isn't it 1929? <clears throat> it is 1929, yeah, good. So even before 1929, farmers were already having problems. And so if we think 1900 to 1929 to 1939 to 1945, these are some crucial time markers for, um, for us. 1900, just the beginning of the year uh, of the century. 1929, the beginning of the Great Depression. 1939, the beginning of World War II. And 1945, the end of World War II. During this time period, exports were declining. So during this time period, what was happening in the United States is productivity was going up during this time. So if we go back uh, to, well, okay, this only goes back to 1948, but this, this is a trend that was, if you went and extrapolated it back to 1900, US food productivity in terms of the amount of food that we were, we were producing was going up. At the same time, the exports were going down. And what this meant for farmers is that they had a surplus of produce. 
And one of the problems with having a surplus of produce is when you have too much of something to sell, the price of that goes down. So prior to 1929, the big economic plight that was facing farmers was declining prices for the goods that they were selling because of the law of supply and demand, which we'll go into in, uh, in a little while. Um, as supply increases, the price drops because uh, you have way more of a product to sell than people need. And so as a result, uh, they're less willing to pay for that, uh, pay a lot of money for that because it's, it's got a high supply. And so coming into the Great Depression, farmers were already being pressured um, under pressure because of declining price of their goods. As a result of this, when, um, when FDR came, came to be president during the early part of the depression, one of the things that he was concerned about was actually controlling productivity. And by controlling productivity, he meant reducing productivity on farms. Because if you reduce productivity on farms, the amount of product that they have to sell goes down and as a result, price comes up. Now, the unfortunate thing about that is that uh, there is no crystal ball that you can see into the future and some things happened in terms of climate, um, the abiotic climate that then made food shortages something of an issue. But in the early part of the depression, uh, there were um, some things done in the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933 that was actually designed to take food off of the market in order to bolster prices for farmers. Ah, and here we are with the with the law of supply and demand. So this is just taken from um, from the Wikipedia page on the law of supply and demand. And so there are two things that you have here. The quantity of a particular product is on the x-axis and the price of that product is on the y-axis. And what you have is you have a supply curve and a demand curve and where these two curves intersect that's where price is found and so what these supply and demand curves do is they relate the quantity of a product to what the price of that product would be in in the market so this was pr first pr proposed by a guy named david ricardo and what happens is that as um the quantity goes up generally what's happening is supply is going up and demand is, is falling as you get more and more of a particular a particular product. And so as the supply curve increases, so if you were going to do something that would increase the supply of something, it pushes the supply curve to the right. And as it pushes the supply curve to the right, if the demand curve stays the same, price basically declines because this line is now further over to the right. As supply shrinks, this curve moves to the left, the blue curve moves, moves to the left, and if demand stays constant, then, um, then price will be increasing. And so supply and demand, the, the law of supply and demand basically just relates how supply and demand interact to set price at a given quantity of, of a product. Now, if supply is low, that means the supply curve is way over here. It intersects with demand relatively high on the curve, and that's because the quantity of that product is low. And so when you have a product that is in low supply, but there is a demand for it, what does that encourage businesses to do? Those of you in the business program. Mary? Produce more of it. Yeah, what, what that does is it encourages corporations to get into that game. As they get into that game, the supply curve moves to the right. As the supply curve moves to the right, the price of it goes down simply because you have more of whatever that product is. Um, how many of you have an Apple phone? How many of you have an iPhone? Raise your hand. I do. Either... I, I do. Okay. What has happened to the price of the iPhone during the entire time the iPhone has been around? 
They keep going up. Going up. If anything, they've gone up, but they haven't. They certainly haven't gone down. <laughs> and so, how do how does iPhone manage to manage price? They keep coming out with new ones. They keep okay. coming out with new ones. They don't support the old ones, and they limit their own production. By limiting production, they keep supply low in the face of a relatively constant demand, which means that they can artificially keep the price high. Now, when the iPhone first came out, it had a touch screen. It had all of these neat features that hadn't been seen in cell phones before. What happened very shortly after the iPhone came out? More phones added those features. Yeah, you had this one company that was that was selling this phone with all of these features. They were charging like five hundred dollars for the phone, and other phone companies were like, "Oh, well, if we want a share of that market, we need to um, start producing phones that have those same kinds of features." And um, as a result, then the number of phones that were on the market went up, and for at least a time. Uh, the price of cell phones in general went down. Now, iPhones did not, unfortunately, um, but that's because iPhones have other things going for them. For example, they're tied to to the computer platform in a way that a lot of other phones aren't tied and things like that. So if supply of a product is low, the supply curve is way over here to the left. That means the price of that product is high, that just encourages people to get into that market, pushes the supply curve to the right, which in theory should lower prices. So this is how supply and demand works for a regular thing like an iPhone or a car or something like this. How is food different? The demand isn't artificial. Okay, what do you mean by that? Who was that, Kenton? Yeah, I mean, like, if you're talking about a car or an iPhone, these are historical demands. They're things that can only be demanded in a socioeconomic environment wherein they're produced. Whereas food is something that is necessity, uh, that's a human necessity across socioeconomic environments. Okay. So... Food is something that you need to survive, and you need a certain amount of it to survive. If the cost of food is high, what are some strategies that you as a consumer might use to cope with rising food prices in the market? If food is, if food is high, do you just stop eating? Olivia shook her head no. Why not, Olivia? Um, because that need is still there. So I think like, I don't know, like there's other like markets and avenues for like creating a space for the price to go down. So for example, like coupons and different things. Okay, so so those are things that are enticing people to buy certain products. But generally, mm -hmm. if prices get high on food, what most people do is they stop eating the expensive food and they trade that out for cheaper food. But it, they don't just stop eating because things are too expensive. If the price on food falls, though, do we then say, woo, food is cheap. Let's go eat more food. Is that our normal response for, for low food prices? Is we just eat more? No. No because you can only eat so much. Now, what happens to maybe what you eat as food prices go down? More unhealthy? Well, you might, you might just change what you eat. So for example, um, swine, swine in the United States have been having a tough time. Pigs in the United States have been having a tough time lately. Uh, because of a virus that has been sweeping through hog farms in the United States. As a result of this, when you go to the grocery store and if you're trying to buy something like ham or pork sausage or something like that, 
you're going to find that those things are relatively expensive. Now, they're expensive because the supply of pigs is low because of this disease that, that hog farmers have been trying to get a handle on over the last five to 10 years. And so you see prices of things like ham and pork sausage fluctuating in the marketplace, depending on kind of how scarce those substances are. So as ham supply goes down, the price of that goes up. And what happens when that price goes up is people don't stop eating meat necessarily, but they stop eating ham and pork. And they go to something like ground beef or something like that that, that is cheaper and more affordable. As the price of ham goes down, they might shift back to ham and cut out some of the other kinds of things that they're eating. But um, that fluctuating price also helps with the supply thing. If ham is more expensive, people stop buying it. The supply relative to demand goes up. And as a result of that price then begins to decline somewhat. So these things all interact with one another, but what people don't do is they don't just stop eating. And in economic terms, this is referred to as an inelastic demand curve. So normally we see demand fluctuating with, with quantity. Um, but what does an inelastic demand curve look like on a supply and demand chart like this one that you see in front of you? Demand doesn't fluctuate, it's inelastic. It stays put. What would that look like for the, the red lines? Come on, business majors, help me out here. How did the demand demand curves change for food? Isn't it just like a horizontal line across? It wouldn't be a horizontal line because horizontal line is price. If that's setting some price. A vertical what would line. Be? A vertical line, yep. At some sort of quantity. So there's a certain amount of food that people need. And because the price changes doesn't mean that we're going to be eating more or less in total. It just means that if it's more expensive, we have to spend more money on it and we might shift what we eat, what our food mixture is that we eat on a daily basis, but we still have to bring in a certain number of calories each day to survive. And so that quantity, that is the demand for food and it doesn't move. It doesn't shift right and left. It's the same. The only thing that it that can increase demand for food is what? So, so an inelastic demand product like food can change, but it only changes in response to one thing. What would that be? What's going to affect demand? Supply? Nope, not supply. Well, so supply might affect price, but supply in this case isn't going to affect demand. If you have more Plus. food available, it doesn't make you want to eat more. You still continue to eat the same. Population is going to affect demand. Yep. So demand is affected by population. If population is increasing, then that places increased demand. If population is decreasing, that affects demand. But generally, in a country like the United States, we have a relatively stable population size. And because we have a relatively stable population size, our demand curve isn't going to be fluctuating a lot. It's where it's at.
because we have you know, X number of people in the United States and it's not really changing all that much from year to year. So that's what it means to have an inelastic demand curve. So in agriculture, what's the only thing that affects price? The only thing that affects price is what? Would it be the supply? It's the supply. If supply is here, this is the price of that product. So we'll just put a little subscript one and a little subscript one here. If we decrease supply, food becomes more scarce, this line moves to the left, and so the supply curve is here. So with less supply, we have what in terms of price? We have prices that are higher or lower? Higher. We have higher prices. If you increase the supply of food, the supply line moves to the right, and what happens to price? Is it higher or lower? Lower. It's lower. So agricultural products, food, corn, soybeans, rice, sugar, etc. All these things, the only thing that affects the price of your commodity is how big of a supply there is. And the reason that supply is all that matters with food is because the demand curve is inelastic. Does that make sense to everyone? You will see this figure on the test. Or I might ask you to draw this figure on the test. You guys are always like, what's going to be on the test? This will be on the test. I guarantee it. I'll either put it on the test and ask you to interpret it, or I'll actually ask you to produce it on the test. The elastic demand curve is vertical because demand does not vary at all with quantity available. Demand is constant at a given population size. As a result, only supply affects price. Now, how does this then affect farmers? And this is something that's crucial to understand if we're going to understand the plight of farmers at the beginning of the Great Depression. If a farmer has a good year, what is he or she generally talking about? If you have a good year agriculturally, what, what's happening on your farm? You're producing high production, sufficient production? You're producing a lot, so you have a lot of product to sell. But here's the problem. If you're having a good year, who else is having a good year? Hey, Your neighbor Bob is having a good year. Sam on the plot over there is having a good year. Generally, when you're having a good year, an agriculturally product productive year, Everybody around you is also having a good year because you're having a good year because the weather was good. You got an adequate amount of rain. It didn't get too hot. You didn't have pests, et cetera, et cetera. And these large scale things like weather are going to influence not only your farm, but it's going to influence everybody else's farm. So a good year is a high productivity year. But then if that's the case, what does that mean to price? for all of these farmers of whatever product it is that they're trying to sell. It'll go down. Prices will go down because supply is increasing. So having a good year means that you have a lot of produce to sell, but because you have a lot of produce to sell, the price is really, really low. Do you remember this section in Poland's book? When he's talking to George Naylor, 
this was in chapter two, which you should have read some time ago, but you might not remember this particular this particular episode. Uh, so it's in the section of the book, section five of chapter two, called A Plague of Cheap Corn. And uh, he's talking about a memory that George Naylor has, has of a story that his father used to tell him. Uh, Naylor's perspective on farm policy was shaped by a story his dad used to tell him. It takes place during the winter of 1933 in the depths of the farm depression. Quote, that's when my father hauled corn to town and found out that the price of corn had been 10 cents a bushel the day before, but on that day, the elevator wasn't even buying. The price of corn had fallen to zero. Tears always came to his eyes when he recounted the neighbors losing their farms in the 1920s and 30s, Naylor told me. America's farm policy was forged during the Depression, not, as many people seem to think, to encourage farmers to produce more food for a hungry nation, but to rescue farmers from the disastrous effects of growing too much food far more than Americans could afford to buy. So, the consequence of demand not being elastic like it is normally, but being inelastic, is that when you're having a good year, you're producing a lot of crop, and so you have a lot of crop to sell, but you have to sell that crop at a very, very low price, to the point that in 1933, George Naylor's father took his corn to, to the grain elevator, and the grain elevator wasn't even buying it. It was basically worth nothing. That's how abundant his crops were at that point. So in the Great Depression, they weren't trying to encourage farmers to plant more acres. They were actually trying to get farmers to pull back on production because there was this glut of food which lowered the prices to the point that, that the crops that farmers were producing were essentially worthless. If you have a bad year and you're a farmer, what does that mean for your productivity? It's low. low. McKinsey, yes? Low productivity. Yeah, so you have low productivity. But of course, if you are having low productivity, what else is happening around you? Everyone else is, so the price is gonna be high for everything. Everyone else is having low productivity, so the price goes up because, because supply is low. Supply is low, price is high, uh, can anybody think of a time when this has happened recently here in the Midwest? Last year, uh, two, 2019, during the summer, during, um, I guess it was August, was it August? I don't know, I guess it was July, later, later in July, I went to, back in the day when you went to scientific meetings, if you were a scientist, um, I drove from, um, from here to Salt Lake City for the meeting of the American, Her the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. I drove through Nebraska, and so I went up I-29, and went to Omaha and then cut over from Omaha on Interstate 84, I guess it is, and headed out to the American West. And as I was driving from Kansas City to Omaha, what did I witness all along the Missouri River Valley? It was all over the news last year. You guys were alive last year, right? I think it was flooding, but I was out of the country, so I really don't know. Oh my God, McKinsey, you, where were you out of the country? I was in Cuba. Oh, you were in Cuba. It was not flooding in Cuba, but where it was flooding was the American Midwest. 
when I drove from here to Omaha, I was actually planning on turning off at Nebraska City. But I couldn't turn off on Nebraska City because the road was flooded to get to Nebraska City from Interstate 29. I had to go all the way to Omaha. And as I was driving through that area of, of Iowa and Nebraska, um, the, the floodplain fields that were there, it was basically like you were driving a ribbon of road that was cut through a lake. It's more like you were on a causeway rather than driving through corn and soybean fields. And so all those farmers who traditionally uh, planted their crops in the floodplains of the Missouri River, basically they didn't get to plant last year at all because they were still dealing with uh, receding waters into spring of 2020. That's how bad the flooding was in the Midwest last year. And so in that case, you had a really low productivity. And once again, with low productivity, you'll have higher food prices. And we saw higher food prices last year in all sorts of things, especially with meat, um, because of not only increases in the price of the grains that we use to feed um, cows and chickens and, and pigs and things like this, but then also because of some, some disease issues. Um, so bad year, lowers productivity, the price is high. So now you have a really good price. Let's say the per bushel price for corn is really high, but what's the problem with that for a farmer? What for making the energy with a low price and high productivity? What's that, McKinsey? Like with the low price and high productivity, you're making roughly the same as you would low productivity and high price. That's, that's exactly the point I'm getting at. So if you have low productivity and, and a high price, you get a lot of money per bushel of corn, but you don't have very many bushels to sell, sell so you don't really make much money. In a good year, you have a lot of bushels of corn to sell, but each bushel of corn is really cheap. So even though you sell a lot of them, you don't really make all that much money because the price of each bushel that you make is, is really low because you are having such good productivity. Anybody want to become a farmer right now? Mary is smiling coyly behind her hand. Mary, you going to go into farming instead of law? No. Why not? Because it's pretty much a lose-lose situation. It is pretty much a lose-lose situation. Having a good year agriculturally basically means that you get stuck with a lot of crop that is really cheap. Having a bad year means that you have hardly any crop to sell, even though if you do sell it, you're getting a really good price for those bushels. You just don't have many bushels to sell. Farming is one of the riskiest occupations you can enter because of the tenuous economics of it. And the tenuous economics of it are because demand is inelastic. And so the only thing that affects the price for your goods is what supply is. And supply varies in ways that are oftentimes out of your control. And the way supply and inelastic demand are related to one another, it makes good years economically not so good and it makes bad years economically not so good. When you listen to news reports and farmers are angry, and we, we, we looked at this at the very beginning of the semester, when farmers were upset at, at Trump because of declining exports for soybeans, which led to more soybeans being on the market, which drove down the price of soybeans. They were pissed at, at Trump for doing this. And then we looked at the price, the price fluctuations over a longer period of time and actually found that they've fluctuated a lot more than they have during this time of, of Chinese, the Chinese trade war. But they were pissed at Trump because farming is already a tenuous business to begin with. And the last thing you need is some guy in the president's office mucking up the system with a trade war or something like that. And so when you see farmers angry about agricultural policy at a national level, 
the reason that they're angry is because they understand this particular equation like nobody else understands this particular equation. And this is the problem that was facing farmers in the early part of the 20th century. They had huge amount of supply because they had geared up for European exports and European exports were falling off during this time. So they had a lot of supply facing an inelastic demand and the price of their products was falling out from underneath their feet. Questions about the simple supply and demand model for setting price. Do you guys see this in in business classes that you've had? Okay, hopefully this is review for a number of you and for the rest of you, if this is your first time seeing it. Um, don't think of supply and demand in this way. Think of supply and demand with the demand curves being vertical rather than horizontal. And when they are vertical, once again, the only thing that affects price is supply. Demand doesn't really enter in. So, uh, let's see. This is stock market uh, performance. Over a long period of time, back in the 1920s, you saw the stock market go up, and this marks uh, the beginning of the depression, the Great Depression of the 1930s. And ever since then, the stock market has been climbing around and has been, been going inexorably up, it seems with the occasional downturns. I think this is the 2008, yeah, this is the 2008 Great Recession. And when you look at the 2008 Great Recession, that dip was a much less pronounced dip than the dip that, that it suffered in uh, 1929, 1930, 31. Uh, this, this actually couple of year downward turn in the stock market that reflected the, the more widespread um, downturn in in global economies oftentimes when we teach the history of of things like the great depression in the united states we have a very united states centric view of the great depression and we think that the great depression was something only that americans ex experienced but the fact of the matter is that this was a global depression uh just like the 2008 uh great recession was also a global phenomenon we were experiencing economic hardship in the United States, but so were people in Europe and Asia. And so it wasn't just a, a, a one nation sort of thing. So once again, uh, you see, this is the S&P composite index. You see this increase in the 1920s, largely due to a lot of speculation, uh, driving up the prices of stocks and then those stocks crashed. And then we've been once again, slowly building, building up uh, since then. So when we think about um, the prices of food, we can look at something like climate. And so this is a long-term precipitation uh, index. Uh, the amount of precipitation per year um, measured since 1891 uh, to the present. And when I put this data together, I guess it was about 2005. Um, but this shows yearly amounts of rainfall at Manhattan, Kansas, where they've been measuring rainfall for a long time at an agricultural research station there. And one of the things that you will see is that here in the 1930s, you have a series of years, one, two, three, four, five years, that were all on the low side of precipitation with the exception of this one year here in the middle. Um, what does that correspond to, this, this multi-year drought that was experienced in the Midwest during the 1930s. Maybe the Dust Bowl? That is exactly the Dust Bowl. This period here is the Dust Bowl. And so the Dust Bowl was called the Dust Bowl because a couple of factors contributed to uh, the loss of topsoil in the Midwest. One thing that contributed to it was actually this multi-year drought. A lot of years without much rainfall, the plants that are on that landscape die, you try and plant new crops and those new crops don't germinate and don't grow. And so you lose the ability of plants to hold that soil in place because the plants aren't growing. 
And so a combination of, um, of low water supply combined with, in this case, probably a couple of decades of very poor uh, soil conservation practices led to a situation where topsoil was just not, not being well anchored on the landscape. And then when a dust, when a windstorm would come through, it would basically just pick up all of that topsoil, create these dust storms, and essentially turn what was formerly very productive land into very unproductive land because it lost the nutritious topsoil that harbors all those nutrients that we talked about in the last section when we talked about nutrient cycling. And so this is a dust cloud coming up on some farms in, in either Nebraska or Kansas. I don't, I don't remember which. And so we kind of skipped ahead to, um, to the Great Depression. But before we get too deeply into the Great Depression, I want to make sure that I don't skip over things that happened earlier in the century. So let me just pause the, the PowerPoint for now because I realize I've, I've skipped some things. Okay, so in 1897, Fritz Haber discovers how to um, industrially fix nitrogen, fix nitrogen artificially, so we don't have to depend upon microbes to do this for us. 1900, the turn of the century, Haber won the Nobel Prize for fixing nitrogen. The reason that he won the Nobel Prize is because this led to increases in agricultural productivity. Farmers now have nitrogen fertilizer that they can put on their fields. This nitrogen fertilizer increases the ability of those fields to produce crops. So in this time period between 1900 and 1930, ag productivity is going up. What happens during this period on the global stage? Um, there's a world war in the aftermath of that there's okay, a major. So, so hold on. World uh, War One. World War One breaks out in Europe. When did that happen? Nineteen. What is it like? Fourteen. Nineteen fourteen. When does it end? Uh. Like 20 or 21, maybe? I don't know. Nope, I don't think so. Look it up real quick. 1918. 1918. So did that affect things in the United States very much? How long was the United States in World War One? Like a year? Yeah, we were only in there for about a year. We didn't enter World War I until the sinking of the Lusitania kind of, kind of pressured the United States to enter the war. But by then, the war was, was approaching the end anyway. And so this didn't affect us directly in the same way that World War II affected us. But one of the things that it did do is it affected our ties with Europe during this time. So during this time period, uh, we weren't really doing much in terms of trade with Europe because Europe was involved in their own war. Uh, they were basically not really concerned with anything not going on uh, with the war. And so this is one of the things that contributed to this low agricultural demand 
uh, during this time period. Of course, we also then had right after this what, which we've heard a lot about now, but we didn't really think about until until now. I mean, I thought about it because I'm a biologist and I teach a little section on history. What else was happening in 1918? You guys must have heard about this with everything going on in our country right now. Oh, was there a flu pandemic? Oh my God, there was a flu pandemic that went around the world. Killed probably between 25 million and 50 million people globally at the time. So following right after World War I, there was a, a, a pandemic that also severely reduced um, global population. It was big enough that it made a dent in global population. And so all of this contributed to, once again, a reduced uh, demand for food at a time when agricultural productivity is increasing. So even before the Great Depression, American farmers were already ex uh, experiencing financial hardship. Uh, World War I comes about why was World War I so easy to kind of escalate at this particular time when you couldn't have maybe escalated this way in 1890 or 1880 or 1870? Um, more advanced technology than ever exist in the past, more complex global alliances. Um like are, an emerging all... form of an emerging form of global capitalism that uh, encourages competition between nation states all of and the drive things, for the endless exploitation of resources. All of these those things were probably true in the 1880s as well, at least as I remember American history. But what changed? It's on the board. That's what I'm saying. That, that, that falls under more advanced weaponry if you're talking about the nitrogen oh. fixation and the type oh, yeah. of bombs that are they're being okay. created. All right, good. Awesome. So how are fixes nitrogen? It can be used as fertilizer, but it can also be used as gunpowder. Where did we get ammonium nitrate before Haber came around? Table that question for next time. Um, figure out where we got ammonium nitrate before we were fixing um, ammonium nitrate using the Haber Bosch process. Um, I did make a flourless chocolate cake and I have samples for you. If you want to come and try some flourless chocolate cake, just drop by my office. Um, my girlfriend was very upset that I was making a flourless chocolate cake and then I'm giving most of it away. Um, so, Whatever you don't eat, I'm taking home and eating myself because it's really good. So if you need a little bit of sugar and chocolate, if you're allergic to dairy, do not go near these things because they are rich and they're full of butter and chocolate and sugar and eggs. Anyway, they're little morsels so you can get a sample of them. I'm not giving you entire pieces of flourless chocolate cake because it's too precious to go around. Anyway, come by if you want it. Um, if you haven't turned in your food journals to me uh, from last Friday, do so. I only got two of them at my door. I usually expect four of them at my door. Um, so those of you who haven't turned those in, you know who you are. And um, I will see you on Wednesday, I guess. Questions before we leave? All right then, I'll see you on Wednesday.